Good evening and welcome. I'm Michael Giesen. I'm a trustee of the American Academy. I also happen to be a lawyer, which I think is meant, worth mentioning in this group here. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's Lloyd Cutler lecture entitled Law, Order and Inequality in Global Political Economy, delivered by our Lloyd Cutler distinguished visitor, David Kennedy. And I'm particularly delighted, and there's a little bit of an irony in that, that I can welcome the president of the American Academy, Dan Benjamin, and a former president of the American Academy, Michael Steinberg, here. And I do hope that you feel welcome at this place and enjoy the evening. I would also like to note that tonight's program would not have been possible without the support, the very generous support of Wilma Hale and the partners and alumni, as I also know, of the Wilma Hale Law Firm. Thank you very much and thank you very much for joining us tonight. The Lloyd Cutler Distinguished Visitorship at the American Academy was initiated in 2008 and it honors the legacy of one of our founding trustees, Lloyd Cutler. Most of, no, most of you will know him. He was a very prominent Washington, D.C. attorney who co-founded Wilma Cutler and Pickering. And he served as White House counsel to Presidents Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, and he served the administrations of Presidents Johnson, Reagan, and George W. Bush. When Lloyd Cutler passed away in 2005, the Atlantic called him the last super lawyer. So much for all the lawyers in this room here. <laughs> in this spirit, the Lloyd Cutler Distinguished Visitorship at the American Academy brings U.S. legal scholars and pr practitioners of highest renown to Berlin for in-depth exchange with their German counterparts and the interested public. Former Lloyd Cutler distinguished visitors include Roberta Cooper Ramo, the first women president of the American Bar Association, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, I remember that evening very vividly, legal journalist Linda Greenhouse, and State Department legal advisor Harold Coe, among many others over the years. Let me now turn to David Kennedy. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce you to this audience. As many of you know, David is the Manley O. Hudson Professor of Law and Faculty Director at the Institute of Global Law and Policy at Harvard Law School, where he teaches, and look at this range, international law, international economic policy, legal theory, law and development, and last but not least, European law. He joined the Harvard Law Faculty in 1981, and in 1991, he founded the European Law Research Center at Harvard, serving as its faculty director ever since. He's advised a number of educational institutions throughout the world and lectured as visiting professor at numerous universities. David is one of the leaders of the new stream or new approaches to international law movement, which draws from critical legal studies and other methodological sources to engage international law. He's the author of numerous publications on international law and global, global governance, and notably his more recent book, A World of Struggle, How Power, Law and Expertise Shape Global Political Economy, brings us up to the subject that we will hear more about tonight. In addition to his academic work, David also works as a practicing lawyer and consultant and has worked as numerous international projects, both commercial and public, with the United Nations, the Commission of the European Union, the Qatar Foundation. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, past chair and member of the World Economic Forum's Global Advisory Council on global governance, and I could go on with this, um, but I would think that you are probably more keen to hear from him rather than me talk about him. So let me just add a short logistical comment. Um, 
David's talk will last for about 50 minutes, and then we have a Q&A session. If you are with us here in this room, please raise your hand to ask questions. And I remind you all what a question is. It's a sentence that ends with a question mark. <laughs> so whatever you wish to say, try to add a question mark at the end. And uh, please identify yourself um, when you speak. If you're joining us via Zoom, please do not raise your hand, not even virtually, but do instead type your question in the Zoom part, on the Q&A part of the Zoom platform. We'll try to get to your questions, but if we don't manage, we apologize in advance. Without further ado, thank you very much. We're looking forward to your talk. <coughs> the podium is yours. Thanks very much. That was a very wonderful and generous introduction. It's, it's a pleasure to be here in Berlin, and I'm very grateful to the American Academy for the invitation, and look forward actually to hearing all of the interesting and productive work that's being done by the fellows here. So it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to good conversations over the month that I'm with you all. Um, let me also thank our, our friends at Wilmer Hale for their support and their friendship. It's actually a great honor to give the Lloyd Cutler Lecture. I met uh, Lloyd Cutler once only many years ago in Washington where he was truly a lion of the legal establishment. And when I decided to go to work in Washington after law school, he was in my mind's eye as a role model actually of the kind of lawyer that I wanted to be. Um, Harvard intervened and somehow that never happened, but anyway, that would be another story. So how should we understand law's role in global political and economic life? That's my topic uh, this evening, and I'm going to approach it as a question of intellectual history. How have the global, the legal, the pol and political and economic life been imagined by the professional communities who see themselves engaged in what we might call global governance? And I come at it this way because I'm not sure that we have a good picture of law's role in the construction and maintenance of a very unequal world as if something about how we usually think about law occludes a clear picture of how it actually works. And that's unfortunate because, at least in American policy circles today, the term political economy has become a mark of progressive and reformist aspirations. It suggests that markets and governments are part of a larger whole that can be studied and open for revision. It suggests that economic arrangements are somehow political, uh, contestable, revisable. The phrase political economy and law signals the aspiration for a new style of legal analysis, more progressive, more willing to regulate, more skeptical of markets, more comprehensive and descriptive and analytic ambition. So to study law and political economy today, and I should say there's a very big program to do so at Lloyd Cutler's alma mater, Yale, indicates a resistance to the complacent and technocratic specialization that's so common in the American Legal Academy now. Now, all of this is to the good, and I share the progressive ambition that we should consider law's role in political and economic life and identify useful points of contestation. Unfortunately, in my view, this recent American literature is somehow cramped by its focus on the nation and on what a right-thinking American government could do in real political time to move things in a progressive direction. That focus on the governing state and its actual possibilities makes it difficult to extend the analysis transnationally where other arrangements, global value chains, for example, and so on, are the predominant organizational form. If you open a textbook today on international political economy, you find a survey of institutions through which political economic issues are said to be managed, and presumably where you might find a job if you're a student, starting with the Bretton Woods Institution and working down or out to important national players. There would be a chapter on the role of central banks and so forth. Placing these institutions at the center of the story imagines the world in the image of our favorite nations as a society overlaid with an effective government undertaking policy in the public interest. 
But that image just has no global parallel, and it's pretty optimistic, even in countries like mine or this one. And in such textbooks, law is not much in evidence. Presumably it's what lawyers do after the economists and the political scientists have somehow figured out what problems to solve and how to solve them. But in fact, the law affecting global political economic life has long happened outside those easy to identify institutions. The IMF, the IBRD, the WTO, still less the UN and its specialized agencies and elaborate NGO networks. Indeed, it's happened far more often in the conference rooms of law firms like Wilmer Hale. So when we frame politics nationally and vertically, so there's a government and a polity, we imagine governance as action by policy, there's something of a mismatch internationally. Meanwhile, we fr frame economics altogether differently as a horizontal field of flows and forces that impinge on national political life like the weather, something we can't do anything about, that we don't know how it's actually put together, but that we can study and predict. Well, all of that makes it much harder to get under the hood and see how political life is legally put together and what we could do to change it. So how could progressive voices get outside these limitations? I'll try to answer that uh, tonight after a bit of history. But perhaps a hint here at the beginning. In a nutshell, we could do that by reorienting our thinking away from the big institutions of government and towards the struggles that happen in a thousand conference rooms as groups with opposing interests struggle over the distribution of gains and losses. And for that, we'll need a map of the legal terrain on which those practices might be found. But it's a pretty messy legal terrain out there. I'm sure those of you who practice on it all day are well aware of that. If you're trying to make a 360 degree audit of the law that might affect your project or your client's project, simplifications like the WTO regulates trade are pretty unhelpful. Commerce, after all, is overwhelmingly regulated, if that's even the right word, by local and national law, private ordering, business custom, political deals, informal networks, criminal gangs, and so on. And then there are all the competing specialized regimes, international economic law, trade law, transnational law, international private law, comparative law, transnational aspects of this or that national regulatory regime. And let me tell you from experience, if you try to draw all those intersecting regimes on a blackboard, you get something very Jackson Pollock. So how did it get this messy? And what, was that all part of the post-war order that we remember now with some nostalgia? You know, that nostalgia, and I'll say a few more words about it, explains a lot of the relief, I mean, even pleasure, if I can call it that, um, that our North Atlantic elites have experienced as it all has seemed to snap back together now that Russia has invaded. Moral clarity, division set aside, Europe again center stage, its conflicts organizing the world, dividing it between liberal cosmopolitan civilization and the dark forces we recognize that. But the long post-war was a lot more complicated than that. So before we get too far, I want to say a word about this nostalgia, the nostalgia that we're now reliving, I think. The post-war order, when did we actually start calling it that? There's a kind of an owl of Minerva quality here. It was so uncertain at the time, particularly at the beginning, the world even more unequal than it is now, nonstop proxy wars around the periphery, nuclear weapons proliferating, the post-war institutions in a Cold War deep freeze, political and economic divisions, east, west, north, south, European empires in fast retreat, transforming into the center periphery hierarchies that we live with today. Still, I can see how it would be remembered with nostalgia, at least in our worlds, and how quickly elites would embrace its return, or talk at least as if it had returned. In 1990, I had dinner with some leading Soviet foreign policy mavens in Moscow, and after a few drinks, one leaned into me and said, an empire is a terrible thing to lose. I hope it doesn't happen to you. But just last year, weren't we all worried that it had happened? That our place in the world had shrunk? that our societies were fractured, 
blown off course by the ruptures of the 1970s, whiplashed by the post-1980 rise and fall of Western self-confidence, and then all the wrong turns and disappointments of this century, failed wars, security pursued in all the wrong places, a global economic crisis, maybe more than one actually, collapse of confidence in Western elite rulership, internal divisions and nastiness, the rise of other powers and other modes of rulership, it's a really long list. And it's hard for anyone in the North Atlantic elite not to be nostalgic, at least for the idea of a global order centered in the North Atlantic, which could be mobilized by bankers and generals, diplomats and businessmen, bureaucrats and citizen activists, even if we know that it was never really like that. Still, the idea is intoxicating, the sort of dream that makes you sorry you woke up, and eager, if you can, to fall back to sleep. In the dream, everything seemed promisingly open-ended. Anybody could join, participate, catch up. Development was available to any country with the right policy. Liberal democracy might come to any nation with the right constitution. The global consensus and the institutional arrangements that underwrote it were open to anybody with the right values. And the trade regime, if you joined the WTO and made the necessary concessions, and the global financial architecture, if you managed your national accounts, protected investor rights, and joined the regime of bilateral investment treaties, the European Union and the Euro have paths to membership, long paths or sometimes short paths. But even the rule of law can be injected into the develop by the development agencies of the North into pretty much any country elsewhere. Now in that kind of world, if outsiders can't be assimilated, there must be something wrong. They must be presenting existential threats um, and need to be kept at bay or somehow not be willing to get with the program. But was it really global or just something European, Euro-American, or maybe just Western European? It certainly was an elite kind of Davos thing, a shared sensibility more than a nuts and bolts order, an ideological formation more than an institutional or legal arrangement. I'm sure you can remember how natural and stable things seemed. The post-war settlement seemed hard won, after all. The global markets rescued from national protection protectionism, a legal order wrung from inner sovereign competition. For political stability to replace war and great power conflicts, particularly here in Europe, required enormous commitment and effort. And there was no going back and lots of ways to go forward strengthen and deepen and expand and reform. Going back would mean returning to World War II, to the economic catastrophes of the Great Depression, to colonialism, and even further back to a world of religious war. You hear that a lot these days. We can't go back. And so we must rather go to war. But the order, and certainly our ideas about it, seemed remarkably resilient. I mean, it had gotten through the Soviet era, it had absorbed decolonization in the 1960s, the oil shock. It had underwritten and survived repeated economic crises and wars all around the periphery, dramatic changes in technology, communication, the structure of manufacturing and finance. Why wouldn't it also survive today's challenges? Well, I think as Joni Mitchell said of peace, it was all just a dream some of us had. And we are waking up. In comforting dreams, things can magically turn out all right, and the post-war order was somewhat like that. Law was a kind of ersatz global sovereign or reassuring father, at once problem solver and ethical lodestar. International law, I remember learning, protects the environment, resolves disputes, affirms human dignity, reduces the violence of war. But as we wake up, we can see that a law also comforts the environmental despoiler, protects private rights from public power, heightens the intensity of disputes when all sides come to believe their cause is just. And law comes not just to limit or civilize war, but also to wage it. In dreams, you know, intractable differences can disappear or fade from view. Elites can imagine that social conflicts and contradictions have been turned into contending principles and interests to be balanced by inspired statesmen, or into what are benignly labeled disputes to be settled by the appropriate institutional machinery. 
But dissonance didn't disappear. And it's not just Russia or China. From the peripheries, whether that's Bangladesh or a forgotten region of England or Arkansas, the global game is much more difficult to play. The legal arrangements are not your ally. They are the tools of your disempowerment. But when you're dreaming, there are things you don't see, things like that. In international legal dreams, injustice slips from view and history smooths out, an arc bending towards peace and American leadership. The way things were, at least in the North Atlantic, at least most of the time, at least as elites experienced them, prefigured how they might one day be for the world if everything went right. And that's why people could think that working for the order and preserving what they'd built for themselves was also to work towards a more just future for all mankind. Now, when you're dreaming, there really is no alternative. You have to keep dreaming. I mean, at least that's my experience. So it's been for the post-war legal order. Although that order has been many things in its short life, the only response to an unsatisfactory Europe is more Europe. An unsatisfactory NAFTA is a new NAFTA. And beyond that, only the power of no, of religion in a secular world, of nationalism, tribalism, and racism against the cosmopolitan <coughs> liberal arrangement. But of course, the allure of going back, back to sovereignty and the politics you remember, Brexit perhaps, or make America great again, is still there. Of course, as we learn from Brexit, there is no going back. There's only an endless renegotiation of a thousand technical questions. So in a funny kind of way, like the Hotel California, the order can always be reformed, but you can never leave. But you can wake up. And it might seem Mr. Putin has woken us up, and in some ways I think he has. But I worry he's done more to keep us dreaming, playing that old familiar song one more time, nationalist war in Central Europe, liberal civilization against the Eastern hordes. We should dust off our alliances, beef off our military spending, forget our political economic travails and uncertainties. It's game on. But the odd thing, of course, is that the post-war institutional arrangements were always more significant for the political economy of nations outside the North Atlantic than for the North Atlantic powers that put them in motion. The World Bank matters ideologically more than financially for regimes across the global south, as, of course, do the IMF and the private banks. While Washington and London matter to the banks and to the IMF IBRD more than the other way around. If it's a governance regime, it's not governing the P5 and the major donor states and leading economies. It's a regime that comes and came to the non-socialist world outside the North Atlantic with law more than money or troops. The impact, obviously, of rules promulgated in Washington, London, and Brussels by the corporations and banks that are established there, but also legal recommendations for development, legal requirements for receiving funding, legal controls and monitoring and compliance machinery emanating from donors, from investors, from international banks, aid agencies, military suppliers, on and on. If developing nations go faster and fall further behind, if the gains from trade are harvested by the few rather than the many, both within nations and between them, if finance and commerce move more fluidly than policy, if things move more fluidly than people, it's law that keeps this all going. And so it's no wonder that there's new interest in law and political economy. And it's not all just nostalgia. There's a lot of worry in our world, and I think North Atlantic legal elites, at least as I've encountered them, are pressed by the same large worries that move their societies. Can ever greater inequalities within and between nations be moderated or reversed, or will something have to give? How angry are the losers? How strong are the new powers? How threatening are the new technologies? What will climate change mean for me, for my children? And of course, what will Russia or China do next? Where the North Atlantic elites might once have turned to law and legal institutions for solace, suddenly thinking that way seems really last century. Today, we find legal intellectuals worried about law itself. The persistence of pluralism raises questions about law's coherence. Does it really all add up? 
People worry about law's effectiveness. Can the international legal order really respond to global problems? The solutions and reforms seem so meager. Apologetic promises, the international community, a kind of village of Potemkin remedies. And I remind us of all this because it's not gone away now that Putin has invaded and some wealthy nations have coordinated their initial responses. Public actors still seem captured by private interest. Corporate managers and investors still feel constrained by their mandate, by competition, by regulation. There's an astonishing feeling of disempowerment at the top, perhaps other than in these moments of thinking how we could respond to Putin's invasion. I remember the years I worked in Brussels. Wherever you went, nobody had decided anything. The commission thought it all happened in the council. The member states blamed the commission. The parliament found things pre-cooked in the technical working groups and so on. And at the global level, there's simply no authority or location, not even a hegemon, that's pretending to take responsibility for global public interests. So that's still the situation we're in. And if you're a student today who comes to law school hoping to spend your life addressing the world's challenges, it can feel pretty stuck. And perhaps that's why the Ukrainian response had felt, has felt so delicious. Someone was acting boldly, courageously. Maybe we could, too, in our conference rooms and and, uh, and, and conference calls. But if we're going to do that, we need to understand how innovation takes place, how people have disrupted and remade the legal universe before. And so let me pause for a little short history of innovation. If it's hard to see how our world is put together, it's even harder to see how much real innovation went into getting us into this situation and how many alternatives there are lying about that could have put us in a very different situation, but didn't. Even international law, a field, I should say, not known for its cutting edge innovations, was repeatedly reimagined. What law is, what international law, uh, life is like, to become the plastic problem-solving vocabulary that's so ubiquitous in today's world. So let me sketch the story quite briefly. International law has developed as lawyers participated in the foreign projects, foreign policy projects of their day. So, I mean, you all know the story better than I, but in the late 19th century, the European legal elites pursued two projects in parallel, consolidating a cosmopolitan order among European, civil, European civilized states while cementing control of colonial possessions. In the U.S., the preoccupations were commerce, protection of American citizens, and investments abroad, including missionaries, and then our own colonial management in the Caribbean, Central America, and across the Pacific. And then the First World War. Smashed the dream of a cosmopolitan legal order among civilized European cultures. The elite looked out on a world divided between a civilization to be rebuilt and more primitive peoples, to be brought progressively toward it if they could be. Dreams of a legal order took a backseat to the urgent task of remaking the political geography of defeated and collapsing empires. The agenda was large, rebuilding the global political system of collective security, restructuring capitalism, harnessing nationalist passions as culture. It was a political time, and international law took a backseat. The international law of the permanent court the last echoes of a Victorian world. Meanwhile, though, commercial lawyers, judges, and colonial officers were developing ever more flexible legal strategies to pursue their interests, embracing very pragmatic ideas about the social function of law. So let's skip ahead. The years following the Second World War, American elites suddenly had and knew they had interests and engagements across the world, and their focus rebuild a legal and institutional order as a platform for economic reconstruction and a bulwark in the Cold War. Theirs was a world of sharp ideological, economic, and military division, a world of proxy wars and nuclear terror, decolonization and development in the South, and of astonishing economic expansion at home and abroad. And in that period, law and politics kind of got merged together in a complex policy process. Commercial and diplomatic professionals were playing with the same set of cards, functional, pragmatic, institutional, procedural. And if we skip ahead to the heady years after 1989, law seemed to gain the upper hand over politics, a law of rules and values in criminal courts, a law to constrain hegemons, consolidate a liberal peace among democratic states, stabilize the newly global liberal economy, enforce a newly universal commitment to human rights, 
And beyond these marks of a progressively advancing global civilization, only outliers, outliers, failed states, criminal gangs, terrorists, and so on. So across that long century, images of both law and global society shifted. And I tell the story to give us the feeling they could shift again. If a century ago, cosmopolitan legal intellectuals worried whether law was even possible outside the nation state, today the world is awash in legal norms, institutions, professional practices, frames of reference. And it took 100 years of intellectual and practical work to make law that ubiquitous. It's a law, though, that's quite different from our storybook fantasy of clear rules enforced by public authority in the public interest. You know, at the start of the last century, many international legal intellectuals doubled down on what they remembered as 19th century positivist legal science, reviving John Austin's challenge, could there be law properly so called among such wonderful, powerful political sovereigns? A distinct normative legal field demanded a catalog of valid rules agreed by sovereigns and interpreted by international jurists. And in, by 1922, this idea gave us Article 38 of the Statute of the Permanent Court. But Article 38 was a pretty harsh taskmaster. Little of the diverse material that was available to legal professionals thinking about law in the early 19th century, people like US Chief Justice John Marshall, for example, could be pushed through its sieve. I mean, no seizing fishing smacks in time of war in the Pakatabana, but beyond that, what rules made it through? As people, including the PCI justices, tried to use law, they modified and augmented this remembered positivism with a series of new ideas. So first, a move to principles and purposes. Where codified rules could not be settled, jurists could find solutions elsewhere. In private law analogies, in social observations, in deductions from the idea of sovereignty itself. I think the SS Lotus case is probably the most famous example. There, the court deduces the priority of territory over nationality from the nature of sovereignty with no attempt to ground their finding in Article 38. And then a more sociological turn. Judges should be guided by facts and realities, not by the rules. Here is Judge Pound in 1933 leaving the niceties of de jure recognition to the State Department. What is Soviet Russia? We all know it's a government. If it's a government, in fact, its decrees have force. So for the court, it's the facts, leaving the State Department to worry about all those legal niceties. By mid-century, norms could be found in social life in what were enforced as norms, interpreted as norms, what seemed persuasive as norms, in a rough and tumble policy process underwritten by shared values. International rules, national rules, corporate norms, hard and soft law, policies and principles, formal rules and informal practices, even explicitly non-binding arrangements could have legal consequences, Oscar Schachter, Oscar Schachter told us in the 1970s. Now, if that's what law is, it made more sense to focus on modes of interaction than on norms, on procedures and processes for handling claims or defining actors. With a sociological turn came a more functional problem-solving family of ideas. Law is what works with a new focus on substantive results and pragmatic problem-solving. Here is Judge Cardozo in 1920 on the status of treaties. He writes, international law today does not preserve treaties or annul them, regardless of the effects. It deals with such problems pragmatically, preserving or annulling the treaty as the necessities of war exact. It establishes standards, but does not fetter itself with rules. And when it attempts to do more, it finds there's neither unanimity of opinion nor uniformity of practice. Wow. So um, thinking functionally, it turns out boundaries between these legal fields were artificial, obstacles to pragmatic action. Lawyers should learn to cultivate situation-specific analysis, harvesting rules and principles and institutional authorities as they seemed useful for the projects at hand. And by late in the century, the regulatory, administrative, and dispute settlement functions of global life had been redefined as activities that might be done anywhere. Cities do it, states do it, corporations do it, NGOs do it, even rock stars do it. Indeed, to solve global problems, one should become a norm entrepreneur. Repurpose your institution as a site for what was now called governance. 
develop institutional techniques to encourage favorable normative development in whatever projects you were involved in. And in exuberant moments, it could seem that wherever two are gathered in its name, there is international law, there is community, there is consensus. You can see how dreams get going. And maybe law is more symbol than substance, more thought than institution, a shared consciousness which could be shocked, a measuring rod for legitimacy, the expression of a universal civilization. It suddenly became possible to speak openly of international law as an ideology. Here is Columbia professor Lori Damrosh introducing students to human rights in the 1990s. With the end of the Second World War, the idea of human rights became a universal political ideology and a central aspect of an ideology of constitutionalism. Now all this intellectual and practical innovation came not as a resigned retreat from positivist rectitude, but as the result of people enthusiastically expanding law's role and potential. And expand it they did. Each set of ideas suggesting, suggested finding law in new places, using it in new ways, applying it in new domains, and the result was an enormous legal dispersion. The less decisive, determinative, and univocal law seemed, the more prevalent it became. Soon, people everywhere articulated and pursued their interests in legal terms, including, of course, people with projects of dominance, of ownership, and dispossession, people seeking to corner markets, consolidate authority, reinforce dependency, or wage war. And 20 years ago, North Atlantic elites celebrated this ubiquity as a great achievement. The emergence of a global order, an international system, a network of networks, a normative transnational legal process, a regime of values which could bring economic prosperity and underwrite democratic justice for people everywhere. That all seems a long time ago now. It's becoming difficult to overlook law's persistent role in, e in economic inequality, political dysfunction, and conflict. Unfortunately, the persistence of the image of international law as a weak ordering and regulatory system, rather than a constitutive element in the ongoing tumult of transnational life, makes it difficult to see law's entanglement with injustice, inequality, and conflict. So how can we come to terms with law's place in global political economy? The first step, I think, is understanding that the intellectual tools to do so have long been with us. When we're not thinking of global legal affairs as governance, we can see things quite clearly. If you have a project in the world and you look out and you see who might help and who might get in the way, you think of law as a terrain, a tool, an obstacle. You might indeed start with a 360 audit of the status of forces, identifying their legal powers and vulnerabilities. And I imagine people coming into their struggles with little backpacks of legal entitlements, powers, and vulnerabilities. These legal arrangements are a record of their past victories and defeats, defining what it means to be a corporation or a state or a citizen, and authorizing some actors to exclude others, change the rules affecting others, expose them to risk, and so on. And drawing on the resources in their backpack, people assert powers and rights, attribute identities and responsibilities, articulate reasons, and so on, seeking to strengthen their relative position. And when these assertions are effective, people yield and their position is strengthened. The outcome is a distribution of economic and political authority. And because struggle is an iterative affair, people fight for an improved starting position in the next round, locking in gains and defending their dominance. Over time, gains and losses compound as legal entitlements, sparking dynamics of inequality between groups, sectors, regions. From colonial governance to modern trade and investment, legal arrangements have consolidated the distribution of rents from global economic activity and the, polit and the distribution of political authority to, uh, to those who are committed to the stability of those distributions. Eventually, law infiltrates our common sense about the distributions that are just, the interests that can be heard, the gains that are legitimate, and the result can be world-making, enabling patterns of inequality and entrenching hierarchies of authority. As a result, I think legal arrangements offer a bright red thread to identify the effects of power in global political economy. And you can begin to develop a map of law's impact almost anywhere by identifying a rule, a judicial opinion, a field of jurisprudence, a professional attitude, an argumentative habit, a legal something, which allocates 
a surplus among individuals or groups, and then you start working adjacently. What other legal arrangements made that possible, made it reproducible? And as you go along, it may appear to you that the allocation is not really a function of law, it's a function of fact or a function of power. But here you go back to step one and you say, what legal arrangements, ideas, or practices enabled that fact to seem like a fact? And through what legal and institutional forms did that power operate? To turn, thinking this way, it turns our attention from governance to law's background role in the foundations of political and economic life, in the shape of credit, property, money, capital, labor, citizenship, sovereignty, all of them legal institutions. Law's distributional significance is most pronounced here, not in the way it regulates or administers these things, but in the way it puts the pieces together in the first place. And in this light, many things we think of as facts can be rethought as legal arrangements open to change. For example, people often attribute the distribution of gains from trade to facts like bargaining power, the relative productivity of factors, the com competitiveness of actors, and so on. But bargaining power or competitiveness depend on the legal and institutional arrangements that affect things like cost of production, barriers to entry, and so on. Economic words like competitiveness and productivity have their parallels in political terms like leverage and persuasiveness. Each apparent fact, he had more leverage, she was more persuasive, rests on legal entitlements, institutional arrangements, and vernaculars of persuasion that could be organized in different ways and are themselves worth struggling over. Thinking this way puts the struggle among groups, winners and losers, dominant and subordinate center stage, rather than the more familiar world of nations, vertical governments, and horizontal economies. And once you have a map of law's significance for contending forces, you can think about how this works dynamically when you turn the engine on, if you like. In some intellectual traditions, this means picturing the political economy as a system. Not the conventional system, how the relevant institutions work and so forth, the system in those textbooks I talked about, but a picture that's not obvious or familiar, a system that needs to be discovered, analyzed, and illuminated by intellectual work. The system, for these people, is the way law really works, beneath the system we imagine all around us. So the capitalist system, the world system, financial capitalism, or racial capitalism, or structural racism, or patriarchy, or neocolonialism, underlying systems with their dynamics, lead actors, and plot lines. The default pattern for systems like that is usually less balance or equilibrium midwifed by reform and cushioned by guardrails than enduring conflict and predictable patterns of inequality. The goal is to identify changes that could alter these underlying system dynamics. Now, it's too bad, actually, that most system theories that I'm familiar with leave law pretty much out of account. Um, which is where I think we can really put the oar in for thinking about how to do things differently. So to take a really obvious example, Marx had a theory like that, to simplify really drastically, where capitalists own the means of production, competition among workers allocates the gains from production to the capitalist, alienating the labor from the product of his labor. Remedy, empower the proletariat to own the means of production. Now, if we bring law into the story, we'd look for the legal arrangements that placed laborers in competition with one another for access to capital more than capitalists for access to labor. And ownership of the means of production turns out to be a really complicated regime that can be put together in lots of different ways, structuring the power of these groups in altogether different ways than the ones that I think Marx had in mind. Ricardo also had a theory like that. As the population grows, increasing demand for food brings ever more unproductive land into cultivation, raising the price of food and enriching landlords who hold the most productive land at the cost of consumers facing ever higher prices. Remedy, repeal the corn laws, reduce the price of food, and impoverish those landlords. Well, here again, the legal constructions, both ideological and institutional, which enable this pattern are really complex. The ownership of land, the authority of tenant farmers, the market for grain, access to credit, patterns of trade, and so on, are all leg legally constructed and might be constructed in a variety of different ways. For global political economy, I've always found Wallerstein's world systems analytics or the tradition of dependency thinking and development economics useful for thinking of hypotheses anyway. Both see the world divided between a center and a periphery and identify patterns of interaction between them that rest on legal arrangements 
including patterns of sovereignty and property. So conventionally, the global trading system is thought to have been put together in a spirit of universal benefit. Liberating trade from national protectionist tendencies is said to enable gains from trade vaguely imagined to accrue to all parties. No struggle here other than against the temptation of predatory politics. Wallerstein and the dependency folks start rather with an external assessment of the actual distribution of gains that flow increasingly towards the center. And they develop in different ways hypotheses about the institutional, doctrinal, and ideological arrangements which encourage that consolidation of gains. From legally enabled relative monopoly to governance, <clears throat> patterns of elite dependence, and so on. All this opens a different door for legal analysis. Unraveling law's role in the constitution of the actors, their relative situation, their animations, powers, and vulnerabilities, rather than the, in the construction of a global governance regime. Well, let me end with a utopian promise. Um, thinking this way, we can change the world. A careful map of law's power in global political economy makes it easy to see trade more as hierarchy than bargain, world politics as domination, and global political life as conflict embedded in legal arrangements until it sinks from sight and can be reimagined as equilibrium or peace or as a post-war order. More importantly, such a map identifies points of choice, openings to contest the political and economic hierarchies and unjust distributions, alternatives to the way things are. After all, for every legal arrangement allocating authority or gain, there was an alternative. That's why people struggle over them. And at stake in struggle are not only the distribution of those gains, but the large-scale direction of society. Economies configured differently will operate differently. And once you know how things have been put together, you can innovate. You can identify and struggle to build alternative modes of economic and political life with different patterns of inequality, different distributions of political power. You know, we often forget how recently this happened. Think how different the ideological vocabularies of the immediate post-war period and those of the 1980s, 90s were. A new generation of players had reversed priorities, flipping exceptions into rules. I mean, just one example. The relative power of governance, governments and global financiers shifted dramatically towards finance while the exposure of national economies to investment and trade volatility increased as economies globalized. Such changes didn't happen for equally for everybody. They were distributional. The expansion of global credit and the erosion of the tax base bound sovereigns in the service of global investors, empowering the jurisdictions that serviced the massively expanded global financial industry or worked in partnership with it. Enabling the free movement of goods and services weakened the territorial regulatory maneuver for many public authorities, but not all. Some found their regulatory influence expanded exponentially, newly able to extend the impact of their local arrangements across the world. All these things were victories over alternatives. Where money, credit, labor, capital, political power, and right had been legally constructed, there was a moment when they could have been constructed differently. And had they been, that might seem normal, commonsensical, and factual. You know, today the gulf between a global economy and a national politics can seem an unbridgeable chasm, disempowering politics and leaving the global economy unmoored from prudential safeguards. But it doesn't have to be that way. We know how to link economic life to territory and community. We've done it before. One of the tragedies of our contemporary situation is a collective amnesia about the very real alternatives lying all around us, an entire history of heterodox analyses, proposals, and real life experiences. Of course, rearranging things isn't going to be easy. We'll need to be savvy and strategic. People will resist. But changing the world won't be done by system or order. It requires struggle on the terrain where inequality is established and maintained. Many are already hard at it, and with better maps of law's role, I hope that people of good heart everywhere will learn to join in. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Well, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, tour de raison. Uh, Helmut Aust, Freie Universität Berlin. Um, I have a question on, 
on the role, the concept, the reach of international law. Because in the second part of your talk where you gave us this history, um, you ended by saying that international law is often much more powerful than international lawyers perceive it to be, who perceive it as a weak governance system. And we should see more how international law is structuring things in the world. But then at the beginning of your talk, uh, you took us through this tour of the textbooks of uh, political economy. And there, kind of, you gave us more the impression that all the institutions of global political economy, which are structured more or less traditionally by international law, are not the place where where, where yeah. the law really matters. You and caught so, that. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question is, of course, I see how you construct that. But uh, when you then call for the struggle and um, the rethinking of the role in this context, and you end up again by uh, identifying that international law is so important in our world, um, I'm wondering which kind of law are we criticizing, are we struggling against? Yeah. And if we kind of end up by throwing um, international law back into the game and identifying it also with these more amorphous forces, are we not blurring the question who is, who is actually agency in the shaping of these factors? So I hope that this is a sufficiently a question, not just a comment, but... No, it's a good question, actually. To, to so, uh, um, well, they, they gave me oh, this, yeah. Around. So I got to walk so I can walk around. And go. they told me where I could walk and not walk. Okay. So it's, <laughs> they're way ahead of you, yeah. the technology here. So, um, <laughs> so I, first of all, let, let me try to break that down. So uh, the first thing is I do think that law that's not normally thought of as international law is more significant globally than international law is. And law and global affairs, so I... I teach a course, I call it global law. I don't call it international law anymore. But even that's not a very good term because it suggests it's global rather than it's private rules and all these other kind of things. So the, the law that's washing over the world is a very complicated fabric of laws of a variety of kinds. And who makes them? Um, there's a wonderful sociological study 15 years ago out of Australia, where did all the rules in the Australian rule book come from? It turned out they traced them back, and a very large number of them were written in either Brussels or Washington in law firm conference rooms. So that the, they weren't actually written by the Australians. In, in Australia, they were picking. So the, who has regulatory authority? It turns out that the regulatory authority of the world is organized very unequally in a very few locations. Um, and that really, uh, now, how, how did that get going? It got going partly in a relationship to something that was happening with international law that both permitted it and encouraged it and, and, and somehow structured it. But uh, so but that was th my first point is that you want to know how law works, it's that. Now, what about international law? Meanwhile, meanwhile, international law has itself become a much more open, textured, and fluid thing and inter found its way into all kinds of different vocabularies and institutions beyond what we think of it as when you first start learning Article 38, treaties, customs, and so on. So both those things are going on. And, it, it, the, and I picked the international law innovation story as an example of a very small intellectual community of jurists over 100 years pretty radically transforming what people understood to be law, international, and so on and so forth from a relatively narrow thing to a relatively open-ended thing. Um, and you can see by the end of the story how it could blend into and work in a relationship with all of those other kinds of rules that come from other sources. So. The, that's how you get the, a Jackson Pollock moment, right? That uh, you run a study law and global affairs, it's coming out of everywhere, and it comes from all of these different kinds of things, and it's very hard to tell what's going to be the decisive rule for a particular kind of project that you might be doing. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the story there. I think that the, we misunderstand both. You know, when we think we had a conversation over dinner about um, the role of law in the Ukraine conflict, um, and we were talking about it as if the law of war was the main thing rather than all the other law about contracts and every other kind of thing that's part of structuring every other thing that we're doing and they're doing and 
you know, not just the logistical chain, but you know, SWIFT is a legal institution too, and and so forth. Then all those contracts with Russia are contracts, and and so what's the law about that? So the, the the law that's all over that is not just international law, first and foremost, and it's not surprising that there's no clear legal answer to the question who's right and is it really a war and was there an aggressor we stopped thinking we had that kind of law long ago in the international thing we have a framework for making arguments um, that is pretty plastic and open I mean it was Doug Hammarskjöld who had the idea the whole point about the UN Charter is it has conflicting things in it and dealing with conflicting principles is the space of diplomacy so it doesn't give you answers. It gives you a space of engagement and so on and so forth. So that, that, that idea that law would answer the question was something that was um, understood to be a bad idea, not just an unfortunately unavailable idea, um, in the, but in the second half of the century. Sir. Hello. Oh, hi, Christian. So he knows more about all these things than I do, and I'm honored that you're here. <laughs> well, Christian Tomashat from Humboldt University, Americas. Well, this, uh, my colleague, uh, he, he uh, raised some, some issues which uh, lead us to the question whether we still can speak of global international law, uh, because what we experience these uh, past uh, weeks means that uh, a very important actor, namely Russia, who is uh, essential for the international system. Russia holds a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. It has a right of veto, and it makes use of that right of veto. And uh, according to ideologues from, from that country and from those governing circles, they have proclaimed that there must be a fight against the West as such, which means that there is a challenge to international law. We thought that international law is indeed a global framework of rules that everyone has to be respected and was largely respected uh, since World War II. Now, all of a sudden, really, you know, because if you say the ban on, on the use of force has no relevance for me, doesn't that mean that international law, as we conceive of it, is just in shatters, doesn't exist any longer? We have to rebuild it from, from the ground, maybe in the private sector. A lot, lot of it is going on quite well, you know, all the trading systems mm -hmm. and, and many things that, that that works quite well. But, you know, at the highest level, at the political level of the United Nations, uh, well, uh, sovereignty, respect for uh, sovereignty of others, and all that, th that is really uh, has crumbled and, and doesn't exist any longer. And, and nobody has any recipe to, to, well, to cure that ill and, and you're, you're bring waking, about a remedy. You're waking up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, that, that, that's a big question. It's, it's very trivial what I'm saying. No, but. no, but it, it, it's not. So the question is, how did we think it was otherwise for so long, right? So I think that we need to ask both questions. Something has changed, but were we right? in that idea of what international law was before last month. And there, I think, we have some revisiting to do of that story uh, and the diversity of positions that were possible within that normative framework before. And then, I mean, lots of people have gone to war with a legal argument, and I haven't heard it much discussed in the press, but I would be surprised if the Russians didn't have a legal argument about what they were doing was not war and was this and so on and so forth. Everybody goes to war for one or another reason. There are 56 reasons, you know. They asked us in. It was really ours. They're not really a country. We're supporting the UN Charter. We're enforcing the principles of the UN Charter even if the UN doesn't believe it. There are all these kinds. It's a lexicon of arguments. And people on both sides of conflicts have been making them for a while, and there's been a huge diversity of views about it. So I think, I think we were living a little bit 
in the in a kind of yeah, a dream state that it was universal and that there was only one way of interpreting it. Well, and we so, lived in some kind of routine, you know? Yeah. And the Soviet Union came to the United Nations. It got a seat on the Security Council. It was fine. Uh, Russia now has a seat on the International Court of Justice. It has ratified many international treaties. And everything seemed fine and international seemed to be acknowledged and accepted and not uh, challenged by, by anyone. But now this is really such a tremendous challenge. You yeah. know, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge shakeup, definitely. So, and, I, and you can feel the shakeup in the, in the sensibility that we all have about where it is and where we're standing. But I think there might be some useful things in it in, in giving us the opportunity to re-examine. I mean, if you're right, we have to rebuild it from the ground up. That gives us an opportunity to rebuild it differently in a way that deals with difference differently, in a way that uh, is less aspirational in its universality and more in one or another way acknowledging the diversity of positions around. I mean, what, what would it have been if we'd had an international law that was more attuned to Russian grievance over the last 50 years, much more attuned to the grievance of lots of countries that have grievances, rather than telling them, well, you know, you don't have a right to it until you don't have it. So we're somehow... We were so confident in our entitlements that I think we lost track of the way in which those entitlements were um, at someone's expense. And, you know, people are people. They eventually break loose of those kinds of things. So um, I don't want to excuse anything that Russia's doing. It's appalling. And we've all been shocked. But where law was in the whole story is, I think, a complicated st the question that historians will have to work out. I think we, we, in Germany, we do feel threatened. And I think the U.S. should feel threatened, too. Because if you have the, well, highest world order is the nuclear weapon, then uh, well, there is a kind of pet situation uh, between the two superpowers or the three superpowers. And, it, it, it the, the balance of power at the highest level, at the nuclear level, a balance of power. At the, we, do we come back to mad, the mutual assured destruction now? I we, hope not. Yeah. Okay. I, but let's get some more voices. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm not seeing who that is. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Oh, hi. Um, so I, I feel, I, I've been sitting here feeling privileged because... I'm a historian who works before the 20th century, so I don't have to disabuse myself of <laughs> being enamored of the post-war order because I work on periods where there, the post-war order was not yet there and the 20th century vision, even the late 19th century vision of international law was not there. But uh, having said that, I'm very much sympathetic with your account, which I'm going to now paraphrase a bit and hope not to take too many li uh, liberties, with the way legal change happens. So, and uh, this is a, uh, it seemed to me that what you were saying was consistent with uh, a view that I um, often argue for, that if you look in the long, over the long durée, in the long past, at, for clusters of conflicts, and uh, sometimes crises, but much more often clusters of legal conflicts that have a way of moving institutions including international institutions in certain directions. And then, of course, one also has to look at this, the thing you were alluding to at the end of your talk, which is shifts in the vision of, of order. And, and, and the really difficult thing is finding how those things align. And so my question to you was, since you ended with this idea that you know, we can sort of fashion a new uh, image a new vision uh, and use it as a guide for legal action. But even if we have the most beautiful vision, uh, <laughs> unless we also can stimulate those clusters of legal conflicts to move in particular ways that will have systemic results, uh, our beautiful vision will be for naught. But um, I like and the way. So, so what's the what for you? You know, what do you see as the connection between those things? That sort of vital connection that will simultaneously, you know, make this vision somehow operative, but also 
uh, kind of stimulate the kinds of legal conflicts that will make for fundamental institutional shifts. So I really like the way you frame it. So for two reasons, which I'll say before I answer your question. One is the significance of the vision thing, so or the ideological formation or the sensibility that there are periods where it's all very confusing and there are periods where it all sort of locks together and there's a thing and everybody understands it in the meaningful people running things, and they then run with it. So we could imagine something in the post-war period, we could imagine something happened that people use the term neoliberalism to talk about, a transformation in the governing classes of basically almost every country in terms of what an economy is and how to think about it and so forth. Um, very complex in what it would be, but you know, over 30 or 40 years, a lot of things locked together. So the significance of those visions is in the overall story is an important thing, visions that are shared through an elite world and sometimes a popular world. Um, and then I liked your agent of change, the idea that it's through a whole series of small conflicts that things are happening. So what you're asking then is how do we get the right conflicts to hook up to a new vision is a really different way of putting it than what people usually do, which is to say, what do we get the government to do? Or what should the UN do? Or how should the big institutions implement a new vision? So it's a way of saying that isn't how legal change happens in the long durée. That's a part of it. But there have to be social conflicts of a variety of kinds and political conflicts that get actualized in these legal terms that add up in one or another way to a shift of vision. And so the, the main actor, we're not trying to find a government program to implement the new vision. We're trying to figure out what work will create the right kind of conflicts to bring that about. And that's where I want to say that a lot of those conflicts could be at a relatively mundane level. So, you know, there's, let's take another recent example. The incredibly powerful move in the human rights community of the last 40 years from amnesty to the carceral state. So, you know, Amnesty International started out very skeptical of imprisonment and the criminal justice system and skeptical of state power. And then with trafficking and the International Criminal Court and no impunity and so on and so forth, the idea is everybody who does anything wrong needs to be criminally prosecuted. I mean, Putin, too. So it, that's the, the, the go-to answer is that, there, is that criminalization is the right way of implementing a vision. That happened through some very specific struggles, often a large part by feminists around the aftermath of the Bosnian War in the formation of the International Criminal Court. But there were lots of different struggles that we now can say are associated with a shift in vision. So that it's very hard now in that world, and maybe it's shifting already, but to ask questions about this carceral turn without seeming that you are denying the legitimacy of and the pain of victims and you're not, you know, all the reasons that you might not want to get into that position. So an ideological formation then disciplines what innovation is possible uh, in the way that, you know, we had all that experience within the United States of criminal law would solve all the problems and then you get everybody in prison and then it takes a long time and lots of struggles to figure out how to shift that around that eventually manifests itself sometimes in government policy. So I think we don't know enough about the way in which individual, this is a way of not answering your question, I'll tell you, that, <laughs> about the way in which the individual struggles conduce to those vision shifts and vice versa. And part of the reason is that we don't think about legal change that way and we're not studying historically the, with the way that you've proposed. And, that's, and, and I think that's actually a problem. So... Part of what I'm advocating here is that we stop looking for a, a universal kind of solution and start trying to figure out where the conflicts are. Now, in order to do that, you have to stop thinking that the conflicts have been resolved or are allocated to their appropriate institution. So we've been so unable to see the conflicts in our societies until they jump out and, you know, Wap us in the face. Similarly, also conflicts in the global situation. So it all did seem very stable until the moment, oh my God, there are these people who really thought it was terrible. And it comes as quite a surprise. 
But it was a conflict structured into the situation. And, you know, how long before the tension builds up? So we're, we need to, I guess the recipe would be to study more and to understand more and to train people to be able to think more about that. Now, I would say, if I come back to William Hale for a second, in my experience, people in global private practice understand this in some way. That is, when you talk to people in, in firms, they understand that, you know, they play for rules by understanding that a selection of a form and a rule in a particular place could shift the terrain for a large series of other legal changes and conduce to some kind of larger shift that would be beneficial to their industry or their client or whatever. They think strategically about that with real open eyes. And there's some way in which that wisdom about struggle is lost when we think about these public questions. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I felt honored to give the, the Cutler lecture, because I think the men like, like Lloyd Cutler were doing this not always in the name of, you know, virtues and wonderful things that I would love to have seen advanced in the world, but often. And so we, I think we have to get that kind of strategic sensibility about small things that add up to large changes. Now, who understands how to do that in the world, in a complicated legal world? The resources to do that are incredibly maldistributed. So there are people that know how to do that, and there are interests who can find people who are able to do that, um, but not in lots of places in the global south. You just don't have the resources of people who are able to do that. But if you're Exxon, you do. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of global political economy problem baked into this thing that the, that the um, skills for mobilizing conflicts into big shifts are so unequally distributed in the world. And that's another aspect that we don't see when we think we had a universal order and everything was equal. It, it, it wasn't just that it was structured equally and people had unequal access, that it was structured to make it possible for some people to play for rules and other people couldn't. And that's just a big part of the global story. Is there somebody from the, from the <coughs> Zoom? Ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Christine Windbichler, Humboldt University, <laughs> Faculty of Law, retired. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, you for, for coming. <laughs> well, thank you for, for your talk. I especially like the way you pulled out the different kinds of laws and, and areas of laws out of their pigeonholes and, and uh, opened up a more general uh, view of all that. Um, I'm a private lawyer, and <laughs> so uh, from this very pedestrian area of private law, uh, I would like uh, to ask what you think of uh, Katarina Pister's theory of the code of capital. She argues that it's not the law, it's uh, who has access to the legal tools and to play the whole gamut, and these are the big law firms. Um, you mentioned Wilma Hale, <laughs> and there are others too. And um, they just find their way uh, all over the world to follow their interest. And uh, well, she, she's focusing very much on the financial markets and the financial innovations that um, drifted apart from, from um, Main Street, from the real economy. and. Uh, produce some crises and other things too, and a lot of inequality. Uh, so what do you think of, of this analysis? What's the role of the lawyers and the big law firms? Well, so this, Katarina Pisser is a professor at Columbia, um, uh, uh, German actually, uh, originally, and she's, and it's a great book. It's a really interesting book. So I, I think and my colleague Chris Desan has written a book similarly oriented. Um, the main thrust of those two books is to understand how um, finance and money are legal institutions and have been from the beginning. So to put um, 
a long story of the development of money as a legal institution is Dasan's book and the development of credit um, is, a, is basically Katerina's story. Uh, and I think that's a more significant part of those two projects. It's to actually understand that things we, in other words, it's a critique of your idea that you're from the boring thing of private law. To actually say, no, 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 no. The, 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 these private arrangements are significant structuring arrangements of society that orient many things, including what it means to be sovereign and what it means to be public and what, it, what counts as politics and every other thing. Um, and we need to understand how they were put together and that they were put together in different ways and that the pieces could be moved around. Now, Katerina did an a in-depth study of the financial regulations in New York and went and talked to a whole bunch of lawyers as they were inventing all these instruments in the run-up to the last crisis. And I, and I think her claim is less sweeping than what you said. I, I, as I read her claim, is that in some settings... There, it, it's turned out that the, that some legal elites have been able to generate a series of arrangements that only they understand and are able to put together and to reproduce those in a way that fuels their own expertise um, and then ca carries with it a certain set of influences for society. Um, so, yeah, she does put the role of lawyers at the center of that particular story, um, and I do remember in that period trying to talk to people about what they were in the investment banking side about the nature of these instruments, and very few of them could explain them. Um, and so I thought, okay, something's going on here. So she's on to something there. But I think I, it's not a sweeping thing. It's that, that in each of many different kinds of fields, we need to try to figure out what, well, is this a thing where a very small set of arrangements made in a particular place are having an outsized influence on the structure of something? And if so, then that's something that's worth studying and worth trying to change if we wanted the society to be more open to alternative arrangements. Um, let's disempower those law firms the way Ricardo wanted to disempower those landlords because they're extracting rent from their expertise. Um, but that wouldn't always be the case. Sometimes you'd want to find some other set of institutions. And so, so I think this is the kind of thing where it's not a general rule kind of situation. It's, it's much more so a sociological um, endeavor to understand how it works. Um, thoughts? Let me just ask a, a follow-up question to this. And I had the idea earlier during your talk, and it's now coming back in a slightly different way. But, you know, while you're kind of taking the boundaries of traditional legal thought away. Um, what is the role of lawyers? Are lawyers, and I'm not talking about the big law firm situation and economic power. I'm, I'm thinking uh. about this more, more generally. Are lawyers actually as helpful as they believe they are? Um, what role do you have for them? Or are you secretly fantasizing about shooting all the lawyers? No, no, no. I think the, the opposite. So I'm, I'm the guy who says law is at the center of everything. All you people, you economists who think what you're doing is sensible, everything you do has a legal basis. All you sociologists don't understand the first thing about society if you don't understand how it's legally structured. So... I am a, law is the queen of the sciences. Everyone should go to law school. There are no other subjects that will get you to the heart of philosophy and social organization. And that's my view about that. So, but, and, I, and, I, and I think that, that, that it, it's, law is radically underestimated when it's understood to be a technical set of questions on the one hand or a governance instrument on the other. It's much more constitutive. It's much more Im important in the ideological and in the social construction of the world than we notice. It's much more the vocabulary of lay people when they talk about their, their relations with each other. So in the book that you mentioned, I talk about my grandmother going and arguing with people when she would travel, and she knew how to argue legally about the, what was going on. Um, and um, it's not just people marching in the streets against the Iraq war saying it's illegal, which always seemed to me a crazy reason to be against the Iraq war. There were a lot of reasons. That was another reason. Um, 
But the, 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 the law is really everywhere. So I, I actually think that the kind of approach to it that I'm proposing is supposed to be, I hope, making it possible for students with a broader range of political, social, ideological interests to think there's something here. I mean, this will take me where I want to get in understanding the injustice in the world and understanding the way the nuts and bolts are put together. And that doesn't mean only go work for an NGO or work for the UN. It could mean go work for Wilmer Hale. But you're going to be at the center of where life is made in some way, and you have to then understand how you're going to think about that. Our, sorry, our, our president. I no, no, don't I mean like to. to no, thank you. Um, Ulrich Fack, Wilmer Hale. Um, I agree with you that law is everywhere, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm really a bit skeptical about the, the role of law you described. Um, I, so my own view would be that law is always closely linked to power in two respects. On the one hand, it preserves the existing power, and on the other hand, it limits the existing power to some extent. But if you want to organize change, I, I would believe that law always trades behind the changes. And when the changes have happened in society, then puts these new situation into rules. Um, therefore, my question is, would you consider law to be a driving force in the change you consider to be necessary? Um, that's a hard question. So uh, I think, um, first of all, it's very hard for me to imagine power, what that means. So we think of it as Economic, uh, sort of, government. yeah, everything but legal, right? So... But I think once you sort of look under the hood of those things, they turn out to have a legal foundation and base and so forth. So a lot of what people do when they're asserting power, like if they say, you know, off with his head, and then somebody chops off his head, they're articulating something that's articulating a legal position also of entitlement and so forth. Now, you could call that power... Hans Kelsen was really good on this. He said, if we imagine power in institutions or in, you know, electric chairs. It's like imagining um, nymphs in trees. That What's behind these things turns out to be illegal arrangements all the way down. An effective, uh, saying somebody has power is a way of saying they are an effect, there's an effective legal arrangement that they're participating in making real. Now, ultimately, when, you know, one can take that too far, but I think we, we, we miss an opportunity to imagine that the pow if we imagine the power people are going to do their thing and then law is going to be brought in, we miss a whole inquiry into how we've enabled those power people and that thing that they can do and where law is in the setting of who is entitled to be in the position of power to do those kinds of things. So we miss out on that background stuff by focusing only on the action. Now, when you get to the action then law comes after and is, is the implementing um, force that then becomes part of the background for the next round. So I think that we're, um, you know, one can take any idea too far, but um, well, I would take it pretty far that we've, <laughs> that we've not paid enough attention to law's significance and to its range of possibility in the background of things we understand to be military, economic, power, political, and so forth. Mr. President. A comment, if I may, and then a question. The comment you were is, the guy, or no, you were the guy who said it. <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 do, I'll have my voice rise at the end of the sentence so good, you can pretend good. that it is a question. But like I wanted to teenagers. endorse your first remark about uh, law being the queen of uh, science uh, and learning. Um, I think you have before you two of the very few government officials, former and current, who never went to law school. And, shame, uh, the shame of it. And I, I personally uh, wish I had, and if my parents hadn't insisted so much, I probably would have. So um, I'm probably not alone in that situation. 
Um, the question, uh, and, and I just want to say if my kids are watching, they should pay attention to that and go to law school. Um, <laughs> so you began your uh, epic, if you will, with an invocation to the muse of progress, right? You wanted to see things move in a progressive way, and that is what your analysis looked at. And I, I want to ask for a kind of global view, because it was, as we've heard, uh, a, a theme throughout that law has been the handmaiden to power in many, many different ways. And yet, one of the things that you didn't really address, and I, this picks up on what Laurie was saying about those conflicts, is the way in which our society has involved, and I, this is true across the North Atlantic, so that there are lots of institutions that can force changes in the law that are essentially not powerful in a traditional sort of way, but are powerful in a democratic sort of way because they can get the resources and their civil society organizations and they can take things to court and move things uh, in a way that was not possible 150 years ago or 100 years ago. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the most recent litigation in the Netherlands and Germany over climate, for example, you know, that would have, if, if, if we had had global warming 100 years ago um, in, the, in the dimensions we have now, that, those kinds of cases would have been unimaginable. Mm -hmm. No one would have been able to bring them. And so uh, I'm asking you to express um, your sense of whether you're optimistic or pessimistic uh, about the, uh, the, the trends, the secular trends towards democratization in terms of forcing those little conflicts that will change the law in the way that you want? Or are we so far baked in that it's going to be really impossible? Well, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm an open society guy, so I would rather live in an open society than a not open society. And, um, and I can think I can tell the difference pretty much. Um, so the more places there are in which people can try to come together and, and have conflict, um, which is how their struggle is the word that I would prefer um, to use, uh, is, a, is a source in which there can be a larger range of possibilities of how the site can evolve. So I have no question about that. Am I optimistic about the current trajectory of things? I think, you know, not so much. I, th I think because we open society people have underestimated the, ex the way in which open society was open to everybody. And we've, we've imagined that what was going on in the open elite conversations that we were having because they were happening in a democratic surround um, especially when they were freighted with ethics. So we were engaged in a kind of ethical discourse of, of leadership and engagement and so on and so forth. I think we didn't notice that that sounded terribly repressive to lots of other people in our own societies. So, I mean, you don't get 40 million people who think that all the elites are off their rocker without the elites having been a little off their rocker on a lot of different things. And one of them was this idea that we were at the center of an open, progressive, and quite sanctimonious development of the good life towards you know, freedom and justice in the American way and all that. I, that was just hubris. So, and, and we're now... Um, experiencing the consequences of that in the divisions of our own society and in the divisions of the world. So that, that, and I think that's one of the reasons that the Ukraine thing seems so pleasant, if I can use that word, because it puts us back in that space where we're working with something that seems obviously ethical and universal and normative and, and you know, and also it has power and it has guns and it has javelin missiles and it's setting lines and leaders are leaders and followers are followers and we're back on, on the game. But I think maybe that's all to the good. I wonder whether it will all be to the good the way we're doing it, but, it, but let's say it's all to the good. What will be the residue for all the people who are not participating in that as a universal ethical agreement? which is actually most of the people in the world. So, you know, for most of the people in the world, this is a European, North Atlantic, American, Russian conflict of some kind. They would have many different ways of viewing it. 
But it's not the universal against the outlier. It's more complicated. And they're in a some kind of orthogonal position to it. And our imagining that we're in a progressive movement forward blinds us to that. And I think we should stay alert to it and, and try to build it into our understanding of what's going on. Um, and that's going to mean that it's not going to be the way we're seeing it, that it's going to be understood by most of the world 10 years or 15 years from now. And what are we doing to prepare for that will be a different kind of question. So, so I, I guess the reason that I'm less optimistic than I might be is that we open society people have made so many errors of hubris in the past that I worry that we are likely to make them going forward and it doesn't end well um, when you do that, when you're not a universal hegemon. That, that is, you know, if, and, the, and we're not. So the, and, and so that, that I think, is, is where, we, where we end up. It's, it's a kind of cautionary tale at this moment of exuberance, I guess would be how I'd put it. I hate to end on a cautionary tale in a moment of exuberance, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Markus Schulze-Kraft, uh, Berlin School of Economics and Law, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm a political scientist, and I've worked for most of my life, actually, in the Global South. I just returned to Germany. And I was wondering, listening to your fascinating talk, you know, if we look at the opposite, not at law, but what I call unlaw, or if we look at not legality, but illegality, um, and perhaps even you know, the concept I'm playing around with, criminality and unlaw. Mm -hmm. um, would that not also be uh, a source and an institution for just those little changes that are totally. being referred to in this really interesting discussion? And uh, it's, not only a, it's not only a situation in the global south, you know, no. it's definitely also through globalization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, a situation in the global north. So how, how, how does the thing of illegality, unlaw, criminal legality, would, how would that come into your analysis? Well, I would bring Thank it in two ways to make it, to put it quickly. First of all, it's super important. So um, we imagine law to be just the law, but actually in most places, it's in a very intense relationship with all kinds of other things. And one way to handle that is to say those other things are a certain kind of law. So, uh, you know, so if you're, in, if you're trying to develop an oil refinery somewhere in some country that I won't name, the fact that there are criminal networks and so forth that it can extract rent from you is on a continuum with the cost you have to pay the government and the cost you have to pay the insurance company. So they're all... They are all having legal entitlements that are going to be implemented forcefully. And the fact that some of them are emanating from gangs doesn't really change. You know, they might even be more predictable than the, the predictability of things that are happening in other kinds of institutional forests. So the first way to think about that is that we need to unbundle our understanding of law to embrace these other modes of social organization that are adjacent to it and very often work in partnership with it. Um, the second thing I would say about it is um, there are a lot of people who just want to be the opposite of what is legal. That's a different idea. Right, so that's the idea. Um, I remember when the, so which were the terrorists who were chopping off the people's head on vid videos? It was ISIS, right? So it was ISIS, I thought so. So, the, I mean, where'd they get that idea? So how is it that you signal yourself as the other to the established wisdom and the civilization and the universal order? And how is it that you say, if you are against all that, I'm your guy? That is, what is to what extent is the form of being an outsider in part a back formation of what's being an insider? I mean, the most classic example is, for all, you know, since 1648, we've been developing a secular order with the idea that religion was a private or a national matter. Well, if you're against that, religion is your ticket. So you want a religious organization of everything. It's not surprising you come up with the idea of a caliphate. 
it's the, it, which you know, is an autonomous development, not an autonomous development, but it's developed in a relationship um, in, in the same way that, you know, kids know what to do and what, where the line is of what's prohibited. And they're not making it up out of nowhere. They're making it up out of what it is that's the normal mode of operation. And I don't want to make people around the world into infantilize them in some way. But that human thing that we are part of how the outside constructs itself, it's constructed in a relationship to us in sometimes a kind of dark mirror image of us um, and just in a way that's bound to drive us crazy um, is something that is part of what we're doing. So that is, we are also setting, it would be very hard to think, you know, when you're embarking on a legal thing, how are we defining violation here? What, what is it that is like an environmental impact statement? What is the outsider impact statement on the structure of alternatives? Are we making some alternatives more visible, more plausible than we want to be making them? Can we be embracing some other range of alternatives and helping them to be constructed, to, even though they're not ours, either the ones that we want to have as our echo? We don't want terrorism as our echo. We want something else. How would we think about that as a legal set of possibilities? Um, so I, I think that's a really... And, and the last thing I'll say is, if you go around in the Global South, most of these places are constructed in a very unfamiliar way from the rule of law Reichstadt of, you know, Luxembourg or whatever. And uh, it's a complicated thing to try to sort out. This has been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.